I'm Mike. I'm Jason. Welcome to Snake Envy. So- Last time, we were basically talking about the timing of snakes coming out of brumation, having their first meals. That was last week, correct? Correct. That they all ate, everything went well? Yep. Great. Uh, You showed us how to make a lay box, which is then going to be your incubation box, basically, that goes, uh, that all the eggs are contained in. Um, So we basically talked about the timing coming out of brumation up to... The snake's lane. Today we're going to talk about what happens once you have eggs. Just with some of the species you keep, some of the differences in terms of incubation periods. Who are the shortest? Who are the longest? Um, hognills tend to be pretty short incubation time. Um, most of them, most colubrids are, you know, eight to ten weeks. My, I tend to incubate cooler. So my eggs take longer to hatch. So if you go 82 degrees, usually you're around eight weeks. I go, I go in the upper 70s, so it adds a couple weeks on to that. Um, there's early breeders, there's late breeders. Hognose tend to go really early. And then your corns and kings and milks and all that stuff really about a month after warming up but then you got your late breeders that you know Sinaloans and Sonoran gophers um, are two that breed about two months after and then there's the weirdest snake the what the snake that's always throws me for a loop is a transpacos rat they tend to breed even later than that and then their eggs take a month longer to hatch too. Really? so um, so they're later at both ends. Yeah, I've you. It's normal for people to hatch sabox, tranbaco's eggs in um, October and even November. Wow. So now, last time you were also talking about the fact that a lot of people won't try to pair their snakes until the females have shed, um, and you wanted to clarify a little bit the difference between. Uh, pairing snakes based on the shed and pairing snakes based on your years of experience and knowing how long. Uh, elaborate on that just a little bit more. Yeah, I I don't go by shed cycles. I do when it comes to laying eggs, but for breeding purposes, I don't wait for the snake to shed unless it's in that time frame that I'm looking for. Because um, sometimes, you know, a snake won't shed for months. And you can miss an ovulation that way. Or your male will be, you know, they keep alternating shed cycles and stuff. So I I tend to go by weeks rather than sheds. And that's just something you've learned over the many years for which species, how how many weeks to wait. Yeah, and there's no wrong or right. It's just my preference. So let's talk about when the eggs start hatching. Um, A couple things I've noticed is breeders have different philosophies uh, once the eggs start pipping. And pipping, for those that don't know, is when you first start seeing uh, snakes breaking through the egg to the outside. Some breeders uh, wait for the majority of the eggs. Maybe there's one or two stragglers that they might cut open. Other breeders, as soon as they see some pipping, they start cutting them. Um, what are the pros, cons of cutting eggs versus waiting as long as you can for them to hatch on their own? Um, I, I'm kind of in the middle. Like I, <laughs> I've cut, I cut a lot of eggs too when, once the first one pips. Um, but then some of them I just don't even bother. I don't, I don't know why I pick and choose. Um, if I feel like a snake, sometimes the eggs get kind of hard and, tough so I get nervous that they won't be able to cut through that when it gets kind of dry and hard a little bit and they that egg tooth might never might, might yeah. not be able to get through that so um, for you it's case by case yeah I yeah I you could if you're not careful you can definitely hurt a snake I probably lost one or two from it over all my years now is that from cutting it too soon or is that from actually hurting the snake cutting the egg 
cutting it. Okay. Um, I did cut um, a gray banded egg too soon, and I incubated these gray banded eggs. It was an experiment, and I incubated them at seventy five, and these things were going on twelve week. Uh, you know, well about week nine, I cut one open. Well, the rest of them didn't hatch for two more weeks. And the one I cut open still hatched, but since it wasn't insulated because of the cut, it took an extra week to hatch uh, than the rest of the gotcha. clutch. So I don't suggest cutting eggs. Before. So so on the safe side, yeah, you probably wait till the, the vast majority of them have pipped on their own. Correct. Um, some of it's probably convenience too. I mean, if you're here and you know you're not going to be here for another week, maybe you, yeah, <laughs> maybe you cut some. And there's times um, where I wish I've cut them because yeah. I had a, I've had a red milk snake hatching, and had its head poking out, and for like two days, and I'm like, what? Why isn't this thing out? And then it died, and then I cut the egg open, and there was it was a two-headed snake, and it was only uh, big enough for one head to get through. So there's, you know, had you cut it, it's possible yeah, it would have survived. It might have made it. Um, okay, so now we've got our our babies. Now, walk us through quantities. So you have about 500 snakes in total, correct? That breed, um, or or are all of them of breeding age? No, I got How about many 250. So about 250 right now. You're working on getting this the year. other 250. So for this year, it's a lower year. Than it's me. a lighter year than you've typically had. Um, so from those 250 snakes, 200, uh, 125 females, roughly, how many babies do you anticipate in total as a breeder that you'll be then dealing with from that point forward? Well, it just depends what you're working with. I was doing, over the years, I've done a lot of bull snakes, so I've had, you know, breeding two, 200 220 snakes, females, I would get about 1,200 eggs, 1,000 to 1,200 eggs. But wow. then you're talking bull snakes that have right. 20, 25 eggs sometimes. Whereas so, a hog snake, hog nose might have four, five? Yeah, yeah eight. Eight at the most? Maybe 10. Maybe you know, they, they, they have quite a few eggs. Quite a um, few, just smaller. Yeah, corns, they have a lot, lots of eggs. So... so from that point, all your babies are hatched. So walk us through some of the differences by species in terms of getting babies to eat. That's one of the biggest challenges you have from that point forward, correct? Correct. That's, yeah. So a lot of these, a lot of the stuff I keep will eat readily. Um, all my gopher snakes, bull snake, pine snakes. I mean, I'll have a handful that give me a little bit of trouble. Um, some king snakes usually eat right away. Milk snakes, it just depends. Um, some of the harder stuff are like mountain king snakes, Mexican king snakes, the Greeri, uh, Theri. Those, Alterna. Yeah, Alterna. Those, those are really tough. Um, like I have Alterna every year and I'm just... You know, it's they're seven months old, and I'm just barely starting to sell them because it takes months and months of work to get them to eat consistently. And a lot of them have been eating pretty good for months, but I want to make sure they're just, you know, they're on frozen thawed. They're eating consistently, and it just takes, it's just a lot of work. And stuff like that, and that's why you see expensive price tags on snakes like that. Because all the effort and time that goes into that. And for people who don't know, uh, Alterna is the gray banded king snake. And they are phenomenal snakes. I bought one from you, um, what do you think, about eight weeks ago? Yeah. And how many meals had she had at that point? Uh, probably, I don't remember. But, but what's your rule of thumb? I mean, you won't sell it until how many, have, how many meals? It probably had 12 at least 12 meals. At least 12. And are those all consecutive? Or no, they there, can were, be broken there was up? body, especially at the beginning. So it's a judgment call in terms of yeah. this one's ready to go or not. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I can report 
and I've told you this, uh, in those eight weeks I've had her, she's eaten every single week. Yeah. And she's eating frozen thawed. Um, but for beginners, fantastic snakes, beautiful snakes. Um, in fact, we're going to talk about Alterna as a potential beginner snake. But it is crucial that when you're purchasing a snake from a breeder that you know, particularly these, these more difficult species, that it is eating, that it's eating frozen thawed, that it's had many meals uh, over that period of time. And the breeder needs to be confident before selling it that you're not going to have the person calling you <laughs> for, yeah. for four or five straight weeks saying, I can't get this snake to eat. Um, so in my, in my case, great experience. You sold it. It was ready. She's been feeding since. No issues whatsoever. Uh, what other challenges do you have with hatchlings? Oh, one of the things I've always wondered, um, not a pleasant thing to talk about, but what's the attrition rate? I mean, how, in a given year, so in a big year for you where you were saying you might have 1,200 babies or so, how many do you lose? How many don't survive after hatching? How many can you never get to eat? Usually I can get most to eat. It's, it's just if I can, I don't believe in... Well, first of all, I just want to say I don't believe in force feeding. I will pull a lot of tricks before I get, I don't even want to entertain that. But so I got a lot of tricks and usually yeah. they'll work. Um, the fertility rates where I have, you usually have more problems as a breeder. Like sometimes it's as much as 10%. It just depends what, you know, what your circumstances are. I used to battle heat. I used to have, I used to be up around 15%, sometimes more. Um, but the cooler you get it, I think that that's a big key in getting fertility. People like, oh, you don't need to cool or, you know, cool in the low 60s. And it's, yeah, you can. I would just, I wouldn't even mess around if I didn't have to. Um, so brew, brew mating the right way pays off. Yes, and, correct. And then you also find that once you get eggs, your your losses are pretty minimal. And, They're pretty that, minimal. Do you think that's in part because you tend to incubate a little lower temperature and you get a little longer? Maybe those snakes are healthier by the time they hatch? Personally, I feel that that they okay. are. and I, But I don't want to say, like, yeah, I don't want to clearly say that. That's just my opinion. Yeah. I feel that. I don't have any data on There's that. There's not a right or wrong way. Everybody has their own methods. Yeah. But, but that's been your experience. Yeah. I do, yeah. But you don't lose too many to starving to death. Um, it just depends if you're, work, what, if you're working high numbers in some of these picky feeders. Another species that I have that are hard, they want to eat. There's just like some of these little milk snakes, some of these North American milks. They're just tiny and they, they some of them aren't even big enough to eat a pink. Right, so, right. So what are you doing then? Are you feeding only heads or are you feeding mouse tails? Yeah, or? mouse tails, um, chicken hearts sometimes, um, pinkies frozen, cut in half, like yeah, just it's gross but yeah yeah not not a thing well and that's why we're talking about these things because from a hobbyist perspective this is all the behind the scenes stuff that we don't always <laughs> that we don't always know what's going on we buy a snake the snake is perfect it eats it does everything like my alterna we were talking about but i don't experience the fact that it took you six months <laughs> to get those alterna to eat yeah. And then on top of that, you're giving them about 12 meals before you sell them. So that's yeah, an least, investment yeah. of time. Yeah. All I know is I have a snake that's eaten eight weeks in a row. I can't, you know, it's hard to appreciate the work that goes into that. Um, when we get to this point in the year, we're probably going to film you packing up some snakes and shipping them out and doing all that. But Walk us through your purchase process. I know that you're on Morph Market. I know you do expos. Um, what are the pros and cons of each? And walk us through just a little bit what shipping snakes is like. Well, I got to do that tonight. I got to get some boxes ready for to ship out tomorrow. Um, it's shipping's fairly easy. 
Um, it's weather. Weather is your biggest factor. Whether you need a heat pack or a cool pack. You know, I love March and April. It's a perfect time of year. Yeah. Usually you don't need anything. Um, as far as like selling at shows and versus online. Um, I shows are show, shows are fun. You get to learn, teach people, and educate people, and and it's you know you don't have to box up a snake. It's fairly easy. But packing up for a show and unloading for a show, like <laughs> um, Sunday night, I dread Sundays coming home to unpack because it's you a lot. And sometimes you can't do it till the next day. And so it might even be easier to ship them. So <laughs> than to go to a it's, show. I mean, really. It's pick your poison. Um, yeah. Now, from a hobbyist perspective, I will say I've certainly had snakes shipped over the years, but I prefer to buy in person. I love expos. I love uh, sometimes you get to see the parents. If nothing else, you can see pictures of parents. And with some species, that's good to see. Like uh, Patuophis, for, for example, the gophers, bulls, and pines, they change color and pattern as they age. And so. I love being able to at least see a picture of the parents, and oftentimes breeders at Expos have those. You get a little more of a sense of what you're buying. Um, and it is. It's it's nice to be able to see someone face-to-face, -face, do business face-to-face. -face. So I've always been an Expo guy. I prefer that. Or we are really fortunate here in Utah, because in addition to you, we probably have a half dozen, you know, well-respected breeders in this state uh, of a variety of species. So... As a hobbyist, it's phenomenal because, you know, I can literally just come and, and pick a snake up from a breeder and get to know breeders a little bit. And I encourage anyone in that situation to try and buy in person. I, I think, for me, it's my preference. Um, but I get it. There's people that live in places where they don't get expos. There's people that live in places without yeah. without your friendly neighborhood breeder or without the breeder who, who sells what you're looking for. So... It's amazing these days that we can uh, ship snakes as easily as we do. But yeah, we look forward to maybe having you walk us through the process of packing snakes up and yeah. and shipping them out. I think that'll be fun for people to see. Yeah, like I've shipped international orders too, and like I like to fill the deli cup up with a little bit of fluff, you know, paper towels or something. Um, Sweet, but I did have a ride. I did have a fishing game officer in Florida give me grief like there's not enough room in here for the snake but they tunnel around in there and yeah. the thing is at the empty space they can shake inside yes. that container and that's why I do it so they don't get shook up. Any any other things with regard to shipping or selling that maybe you think you do a little differently than some others? I used to do this as a. Um, precautionary thing and then it got expensive but i used to like if i'd have a stack of five or six daily cups i would get those diabetes socks ah, that and compression could, socks compression yeah compression socks and i would put them in there tie them a knot because if they popped a lid container yes. they'd be stuck in the sock i used to do that um and i kind of wish i did but it just got too expensive um make sure your heat packs or cool pack is not touching your snakes in the you know in the box so you yeah. can, i always build a little cardboard little wall little barrier so, barrier so to protect them from vice versa interesting so when it comes to this time of year anything else anything that i didn't ask you about that's important or um, that people might find interesting one thing we didn't really touch on about as far as breeding and stuff was like we didn't get into egg laying like incubating eggs and i don't know if you wanted to get into that we touched on it in the last video but i know there's some things you do differently than some others so yeah tell us about that a little bit temperature being one but well temperature i like lower temperatures like i said um and i i like the same temperature as my I like to incubate the same temperatures I like to keep my snakes out and that's 78 degrees that's prime temperature for me I know a lot of people do 81 even in their snake rooms I like to 
this room fluctuates too, day to night. Um, I like to incubate. I don't use an incubator. I use, I just shelf them. And so they, the and, yeah, temperature. And you're using styrofoam coolers. Yeah, I do. I use a styrofoam that, container. That helps to balance out just the, the drastic, but yeah. the drastic fluctuations. But I don't even think that matters too much. I think it's, I think it is a good thing to have some fluctuation in your egg as they're growing. Not every day's 81 or 82. I think it's good to bounce around from 75 to 80. I, I would imagine I, that's happening in the wild to some well, degree. Of course, it can't be perfect, even when they bury them or do yeah. whatever. Yeah, I mean it just depends. Yeah, you know how deep they are. Well, I remember the question I was going to ask you. Tell us a little bit about your strategies when you're pairing. So, just before we started filming, uh, you had a corn snake pair that's been in there for how long? We don't know whether they've locked or not. Two days. So they've been in there for two days. When we opened the the tub. They weren't locked. They weren't together. In fact, one was in the hide, one was on top of the hide. Yeah. Um, but we went ahead and put another female in. So now you've got one male and two females, correct? Yeah, and I think that's totally acceptable. Yeah. I mean, probably not with kings and milks right. so much. <laughs> I mean, I do it. I'm guilty of it. I do it. Um, but I, I, if I have a big enough cage, I'll put... I've had three females to one male in the same cage for breeding. And that makes sense to me in a common sense way because maybe two of them prefer each other more than the others. Um, it just works. <laughs> yeah, I mean... And, I haven't had much problems. And the worst case is he mates with all three, right? Right. Well, and then you'll... <laughs> Either way, it's but, a win-win. Yeah, it just depends. Like, sometimes I don't like to spread my males more than five females. I have yeah. done that. I I did that two years ago. I, I tried to breed seven females to one male, and I just, it just never, I never got to the last one. Right. And it's yeah. hard. Um, but fl bounce your females around. I, I like to, after they eat, give them three days, three to four days to digest, and then give them three days together to breed. During the empty, when their stomachs are empty. I'll so for corn snakes, for example, for those that we were talking about, how many weeks is pretty much their window for ovulating and for mating, for, for locking? Is it a like a four to six week process or? Yeah, it's like, I would say th maybe even possibly three weeks, three but weeks. I usually go four and that will last. They can breed up to around... Well, they can breed even later in the year, but typically in a breeding season, it's four to four to eight weeks. Um, even when they're gravid, I can tell they're gravid. I'll right, still right. I'll still put them together and try to ensure that fertility. And as a breeder, what percentage of the time do you know for certain they've locked, and what percentage of the time are you, you know, you didn't witness it, but you're fairly certain they locked and you're just trusting that, that the process worked well, i probably don't i probably i probably see less uh less than 10 percent breed of myself oh okay so i don't i'm not here all day like, right right well that's why i asked the question because i, I put think them together that, and i leave and yeah it happens i think that would surprise people i think people would probably assume that you have a lot more confidence but yeah, you know what they want to do this time of year. Yeah, it's, um, it's not hard. And so it's a reasonable assumption that they're going to do what you want them to do. But that's fascinating. That's interesting. You don't get to witness the vast majority, and you just kind of trust that nature's yeah. going to run its And course. usually I'll put them together, and I can hear them yeah. doing stuff in there. Well, like, <laughs> as, soon as, we added, yeah, as soon as we added the third snake to that tub, as we walked away, we heard... You know, a, lot of, a little thrashing <laughs> going on. We heard some commotion. So they definitely noticed that the other female was introduced. Um, so that covers it for, uh, for breeding. And we will, again, touch on this subject later as we go because we're going to be able to film some eggs pipping. We're going to be able to film you shipping. Um, so we definitely have a lot more content to uh, get to in terms of this breeding season. Please like and subscribe. Please comment if you have different ways and methods of breeding that you'd like to share. 
we're hoping to be able to do some episodes where we just answer questions. So you've got an expert here to ask questions if you're just getting started in breeding. Uh, feel free to drop us those questions. Thank you. Thanks.